this evening will be looking at a lesson dealing how to hear. So, put your big ears on and uh, make sure you come tonight. We've been looking at a study of David in Acts the, 20, the 13th chapter in verse 22 in particular. God telling them after or after God had taken away Saul, the son of Sis, they gave him, or God gave them David to be their king, and gave this testimony concerning David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who shall fulfill all my will. We have looked at different aspects of why David would be called a man after God's own heart. And we have been looking at the aspect of uh, the fact that David had a respect for that which was holy. And we had from that uh, just taken that as an opportunity to go through and look at some things that we need to consider a holy and have respect for that which is holy. Certainly, it, the Bible falls under that category that we must respect God's Word. Have the type of respect for it that we will not add to it, take away from it, or change it, or alter it in any way. And instead, that we will, as Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, do all the words which I command you this day. We also began looking at the church and how we need to have a respect for the church, its organization, that Christ is the head of the church, that within the local congregation there is the elders who oversee the work of the congregation, and then deacons who are special servants in regards to the work of the church. The worship of the church certainly needs to be respected by, uh, by all individuals. And that we worship the Father in spirit and in truth with proper attitude, but according to God's word, and that God has set forth five ways through which we worship Him, our singing, our prayers to the Father through Christ, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, the study of God's word or preaching aspect, and then the contribution and the giving of our means into that common treasury of the Lord's church. We need to also respect God's plan that he established for the salvation of man, that through his grace and offering his son to die upon the cross for our sins, that God has done that which provided man salvation. But man has to procure that salvation he does that when he, upon hearing God's word, uh, comes to have faith in God and in Jesus Christ as his son, that he died for our sins. Upon that faith, we repent of our sins. We turn away from them and turn to God in God's appointed way. We confess our faith that we have for our Jesus as God's son, and then we're to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins and then live a lifetime of faithfulness to God and obedience to His will. And so we need to respect that plan that God has established. We need to uh, respect the work that God has set forth for the church to do. That work is the saving of souls. That saving of souls is done through three avenues again. It is done through the preaching of God's word, the gospel to a lost and dying world. There is the edification of those who are saved, the edifying through, again, the Word of God. And in that area of benevolence, in which we are benevolent in meeting the needs, physical needs, of someone. But again, that benevolence is directed toward and for the purpose of saving their souls. Then we also need to respect the name of the church. We need to recognize that the church belongs to Christ. In G uh, Jesus stated in Matthew the 16th chapter, upon Peter's confession of his faith in Jesus as God's Son, that I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus here sets forth the idea that he's going to build his church. And the idea of that phrase, my church, shows ownership in relationship to that church. That it belongs to him. It doesn't belong to someone else. It doesn't belong to some man here upon this earth. It belongs to Christ. And since it belongs to Christ, it certainly needs to be called by the name of Christ and not by someone else or something else. But also, when we recognize that the church belongs to Christ, it sets forth the authority principle for us that He is that one who is, has the authority, as Matthew 8, 28 and verse 18, would, He says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. He has that authority. And thus we have to hear him and whatsoever he says that we must do. Uh, because, and we find from John 12, verse 48 through 50, that he's speaking for for God. Or also Hebrews 1, verses 1 and verse 2. And so here it's his church. So it belongs to him. It's his right by right of purchase price. He purchased the church. But, but as a result of that, since it belongs to him, it, be, it is his by right of purchase price, any name or any phrase or term that would indicate that the church belongs to him certainly would be a term or a phrase that would be permissible and referring to that church that is his. My church, Jesus says. We, through... Our history have used the term Church of Christ. And we find that because in Romans 16 and verse 16, salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Some have said the, word, the phrase Church of Christ is not found in the Bible. But if you have a plural churches of Christ, then the singular would be Church of Christ. The churches of Christ, though, in the plural here, is referring to various congregations. Like here, we have the congregation, the Bellevue congregation. Another place would have the such and such congregation or church of Christ. Or this other location would have this location, church of Christ. Different congregations, different churches. But all of them belong to Christ. They're not different in the nature of the organization, the plan of salvation. Those doctrinal matters that would affect the church, they're all the same. And so they are churches of Christ. But if you're talking about one, you'd be talking about the church of Christ. And so here you have that phrase. It is very simply, though, a descriptive phrase that here's the church that called out people, called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. And that that group of people, the church, belongs to Christ. That's all it's describing and that's all it's referring to. It's not a name in the sense that we would oftentimes think of a name. It is a descriptive term. And from that standpoint, yes, it is a name, but uh, there is not just one name for the church. Again, any term or any phrase that describes this called out people, the church, as belonging to Christ is certainly acceptable with God. And thus we would see Acts 20, chapter and verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Here, obviously, the church of God, God there has reference to Christ, because it was Christ who purchased the church with his own blood. And so it's referring to Christ, thus the church of God, since Christ is God, John 1 and verse 1, to refer to that called out people, the church, as the church of God would certainly be right because it shows that it belongs to Him, that one who has called us 
or that one who hath purchased us with his own blood. And thus the church of God. Since the church, or also 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called, literally called saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Here is individuals who are called saints. They are the church of God. Those who are called saints are those who are Christians. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. But here, those individuals called saints comprise the church of God. Again, the idea of God there would be that idea of Christ, and since he is God, it is right to call him God, and thus the church belonging to Christ, the church of God. Because God is, or Christ is God. Since the church and the kingdom are one and the same, we would say, for example, Jesus saying, Matthew the 20th, uh, in John the 18th chapter, verse 36, my kingdom, find Mark, and uh, Matthew 16 and verse 18, he called it my church. Now then he's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Three times he uses that phrase, my kingdom. He shows ownership of the kingdom. And thus, it would be right and proper to say the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of God. In Matthew 16, chapter verse 19, we again see that idea that the church and the kingdom are the same. When he says that I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Right, so thou shalt bind therefore on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Once or thou shalt loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. He has said in the previous verse, I'm going to build my church. He tells Peter, I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom. He's not going to give him the keys of one thing and yet build something else. That which he builds, he's going to give Peter the keys of. And thus the church and the kingdom, one and the same institution. Simply referring to different aspects of that institution. The church dealing more from the standpoint, they are individuals who have been called out by God, called by the gospel of Jesus Christ into the marvelous light of Christ, as we mentioned earlier in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. The kingdom showing more of the aspect of the rulership of Jesus and Nazareth that he is, as Paul would put it in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And thus, here is the rulership, the reign of Jesus, and that we submit ourselves to his rulership and reign. But again, it is his church, his kingdom, that by any phrase or any term that would refer to the church or the kingdom as belonging to Christ would certainly be an acceptable phrase in relationship to that group of individuals. But there's other terms as well. We're not going to try and go into all of them this morning. But where it find the body of Christ. For example, there's one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 5. That body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, 18. And so the body of Christ or uh, the body of God even, in relationship to that because again Christ is God in Ephesians 5th chapter we find that the church referring to or is referred to as the bride of Christ and as the husband is to love his wife so Christ loves the church and gave himself forth there is again that purchase price of the church but here, that figure is of a bride. And so the bride of Christ would certainly be right in calling that church or the bride of God. In Hebrews 12, chapter and verse 25, we see the church of the firstborn. And many times it's just referred to simply as the church. All of these terms, all of these are proper in using and then referring.
referring to this group of individuals. We need to have respect for that name that God has given and that we wear. That name of the church, the church of Christ. But how can we have respect, the proper respect, and refer to that group of individuals by something other than Christ? Whether it's some individual, or some group of individuals, or some type of organization that it portrays. Where is the respect for that which God has set forth in relationship to those things as opposed to calling this by the church that shows its ownership, that it belongs to that certain individual? And so we won't be calling ourselves the Presbyterian Church, which refers to the presbyters as the, the organization of that, con that group of individuals, that it's going to be ruled by presbyters. We don't want to glorify the presbyters. We want to glorify Christ. Or the Episcopalian Church. Well, again, the Episcopalist is dealing with those rulers, those who oversee the church. Again, referring to that organization, all that, that group. But again, we don't want to glorify them. We want to glorify the owner, Christ. And we could go on with name after name that we see as we go through uh, the yellow pages or go through our towns and we see all of these different religious groups calling themselves by different names. But how is it respectful to Christ and respecting that which is holy, the name that God has given this group of individuals that belong to him, by calling it by some other name. Taking that figure of the bride of Christ, because that's what Paul uses there in uh, Ephesians 5th chapter. When I married Karen, she took upon her my name. She is not and has been more than she was before. She was before that, Karen Savage. Now then, she has taken my name, Karen Hatcher, because she belongs to me. She is mine, in that sense. We take the name of Christ. How insulting would it be for her to take, well, yes, I want to marry you, Michael, but I want to be called by this person over here's name. And no, no way that's going to happen not going to happen. It's not going to take place. You're going to wear my name. So it is with the church. Christ is that husband. And we are the bride of Christ. We take his name. We need to have a respect for that name and not calling it something else. But then also the name Christian as well. In Isaiah, the 62nd chapter, Isaiah says that the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness in all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Here is a promise, and uh, if you actually go back to get the lectureship book uh, on, from a couple, um, well, not this past one, but the one last year, dealing on the major prophets or lessons from the major prophets. Uh, my chapter dealt with this passage right here and this new name that we're going to be called. The little name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And we, in that chapter, dealt with the fact that it would be after the Gentiles see the righteousness of God that took place in Acts 10th chapter when the gospel is first taken to the Gentile world at the house of Cornelius. All kings, I glory, are actually that idea as the rulers. They're going to see the glory of God, and uh, certainly the Jewish rulers will see that, uh, even going back in Acts 3rd chapter and 4th chapter. And uh, as uh, with other passages as well, showing the rulers seeing the glory 
of God. And then being called by a new name. It's a new name. It's not an old name. It's not a refurbished name. There are many terms that the Jews in the Old Testament were referred to and referred by. But here's something that's not going to be like that. It's going to be a new name. It's a name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And it was not given in derision as some people view the term Christian. Uh, but it was given by God Himself. Earlier in chapter 56 of Isaiah, in verse 5, He tells us, Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls and a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And so here in these two passages, we have that prophecy of this new name that's going to be given. It's going to be an everlasting name, a name that will not be cut off. When we come to the New Testament, and in this already, it's going to take place after the Gentiles see the righteousness of God, which takes place in Acts 10th chapter. After that takes place, chapter 11 then, talks about Barnabas finding Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, and he brings him to Antioch. And it came to pass, he says, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much, much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Those who followed Christ, even when Christ was upon this earth, were oftentimes referred to as disciples. So that can't be that new name. They referred to it within the Jewish community, each other as brothers. And so it could not be that name. But here is a new name, the name of Christian, that is now being given. We need to have a respect for that name. That we are certainly going to respect that name as to what we are. That we are Christians. The term itself, Christian, is made up of two parts. Christ and then the suffix, which means life. And so it's often referred to as Christ's life. We are to be like Christ within our life. That's showing respect for that name that we wear. This name that we wear of Christians is not something that we simply put on when we come to worship services on Sunday morning and maybe Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then as we leave this building and go out in the world, we take off that coat of Christian and we live like the world. No. That's not the way in which it's to be. We are representing Christ in everything that we do. As we live our lives, as it's put today, 24-7, every day of every, every hour of every day, we are representing Christ within our life. And that's why it is to be Christ in you, Paul would write in Colossians 1 and verse 23. Or for me to live is Christ. Philippians 1 and verse uh, 21. Or as he writes in Galatians, the second chapter, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What is it? It's Christ living in me. The life that I am living here on this earth, it's not my life anymore. It's Christ living through me. So everything that I do, everything that I say, every thought that I make, it's to be Christ living in me. It, we are representing Him within our life. When someone sees us, they see someone who is a Christian. Are they seeing someone who is Christ-like or devil-like? Are they seeing someone who, as Jesus says, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either gathering with me or you're scattering abroad. When they see you in your life, are they seeing someone who is drawing them to Christ or drawing them away from Christ? Pushing them away from Christ. You see, we are representing Him within our life. In everything that we do, every action that we take, are we proper? 
proper representatives of Christ. That's what respecting the name Christian is going to involve. It's not just there saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, look at me, I'm a Christian. It's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But what? It's the one who does the will of the Father. What is that? That's representing Christ here upon this earth. And thus, the New Testament was written. Why? To guide us as to the thought processes that we are to have. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 and verse 5. What is it? You have the mind of Christ. You have the thought processes, the attitudes within your mind that are Christ. Whatever it is that Christ thought, that's what you were to think. The attitude that Christ has about a certain thing, that's the attitude you were to have, that I am to have. What is it? Romans 12th chapter, first two verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is it? You change your mind. When you are baptized into Christ, you become a Christian. What is it? You have the mind of Christ. You transform. There is that change. There is that repentance that takes place. But it takes place in the mind. There is the starting point. It's a change of mind. A change of attitude. Because the attitude of this world is not the attitude of Christ. The purposes of this world is not the purpose of Christ. And so we change our attitude, our thinking, to come in line and in harmony with the thinking of Christ. But notice that in that passage in Romans 12th chapter, he tells us to not be conformed to this world. Instead, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Unto God. What is it? That change that takes place in the mind has its effect upon our life. And so the actions that we take are also changed. What is it? We're representing Christ by our actions. Our thought processes have changed to be like Christ, so our actions change to be like Him. And so as we live our life, it's, yes, Christ living in me. And when people see us, they don't see my Thatcher, for example, but they see Christ. Why? Because, remember in Galatians, the third chapter, we, all, we oftentimes talk about verse 30, uh, 27 in relationship to getting into Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, what do we do? We put on Christ. What is it? We're living the life of Christ now. So when people see us, they see Christ and not me. We put on Him. What is it? We're being a Christian. We're living like Christ. And we want to do what Christ does. Live like Christ lives. That's respect that we are going to have for that name that we have been given. That name that God gave unto us, that name of Christian. But then, why would anyone want to refer to themselves by any other name? Why would I want to refer to myself as a Lutheran in honor of Martin Luther? or a Methodist, or a Baptist, or a Catholic, or an Episcopalian, or a Mormon, or any of these other terms that are out there. Why would one want to simply wear that name that was given to us by God, the name of Christian? And some will say, oh, well, those are Christians also. Why do I have to wear a hyphenated Christian name? You mean to tell me it's a Baptist Christian? No. 
one is either a Christian or he's not a Christian. If he's a Christian, that's all that he is. To be a Baptist, you have to follow Baptist doctrine. You have to be like a Baptist would be. To be a Methodist, you have to follow Methodist doctrine and you have to think Methodist doctrine and think and thus live according to Methodist doctrine. And the same would be true of Catholicism or Lutheran or Mormonism or any of these other religious groups. You have to think according to what they teach not what the Bible teaches. You have to then live according to what they set forth instead of what the Bible sets forth. And if someone should argue, oh, well, what they teach is what the Bible teaches. Well, if it is, then they wouldn't be that denomination. They would simply be a Christian. And they would wear that name of Christ instead of the name of their group. We need to have a respect for that name of Christian as well as the church and the name of Christ. But then one other thought this morning, and that is the worship services themselves. We dealt with the worship earlier in this lesson, series of lessons, but we want to deal with the worship services. We should have a reverence and a respect of the worship that God has set forth for us enough to attend. David writes the 122nd Psalm in verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It made his heart rejoice that he had the opportunity to go to the house of the Lord. To go and worship God. I wonder many times if we feel that same joy, a rejoicing attitude, to have the opportunity that has been provided to us to come and worship God. We oftentimes thank God for the opportunity to come together without fear of molestation, without fear of reprisals by the government or by others. But do we have the joy that we should have in coming together to worship? We should be thankful that we're not going to be molested. But, and that we have a place such as this to come together to worship God. But do we have the joy that goes with that? Are we excited to have that opportunity to come to worship? Or do we have the attitude as expressed by some, well, I've got to go. And like, I've got to go I'll put my time card in and get it stamped so that I'll have my time put in and I can get paid on the day of judgment by going to heaven. Is that our attitude? Or is it an attitude? I just can't wait till Sunday gets here. I can't wait till Sunday night gets here to come and be with saints and enjoy worshiping God together. That's the attitude David was expressing here. I was glad when they said to him, let's go in the house of the Lord. A joy in it. And in that, certainly we should have an attitude of reverence and respect for God that should be demonstrated in our worship. Several years ago, I believe it was at the Nashville Jubilee, Marvin Phillips preached a sermon, and in that sermon, it was basically taking the uh, feast when the prodigal son returned home, and the fact that they threw a feast, and he said that that feast was worship, and that that's what our worship services should be like. It should be uh, just enjoyment, fun, merriment. And in that, he said, it should be like uh, some would be singing Amazing Grace while someone's hugging grace. We need to realize that we are coming before the throne of God. That there is a reverence and a respect there. We need to remember whom we are worshiping. That it's the God of heaven and he needs to be in 
and deserves our reverence and our respect. He's not like we are. He's not like that prodigal son who's returning home. Yes, they should have enjoyed themselves and made merry. But we need to remember we're coming before the throne of God. One individual in a prayer to God in a public assembly began a prayer with the words, Daddy, a lack of respect for who we are worshiping. We need to remember that He is the creator of this universe. And we need to show the proper reverence. We need to come before him with reverence and godly fear, Hebrews 12 and verse 28. Now, in that attitude, when we remember who we're going to wear, who we're going to worship, we're going to express itself in yes, the clothes that we wear. It's going to represent itself or going to express itself in how we Worship as to whether or not we're sitting there, you know, daydreaming of maybe what we're going to have or to eat or a car race or a football game or this or that. It's not going to be seen passing notes to each other and talking to each other, doing other things within that. It's one to express when we have the proper reverence and respect for God that we are to have. It's one to respect. It's one to express itself in how we deal with ourselves while we're worshiping. The clothes that we wear, the attitudes that we have, the speech that we have, everything about it will be. I am just coming before the very throne of God. I'm one to reverence. I'm one to respect him. Beautiful study was to go back into the Old Testament as the children of Israel now are at Mount Sinai. And God is going to give them his law. How he tells them you need to purify yourselves first. And so they spend three days purifying themselves. Then they come before Mount Zion or Sinai. And they hear the thunder and the lightning coming from God. And it says they exceedingly were fearing and uh, quaking in their shoes, trembling because of the holiness of God and His majesty. So much so that they finally said, No, we don't want to hear from God. Moses, you go up and get God's law. Why? Because they had such a fearful attitude to God. A reverence and a respect that they demonstrated for Him. Should we be excited to be able to come and worship that creator of the universe, the sustainer of life? Absolutely. But we need to do so with the proper attitude. That we're coming together to worship Him. And then worship Him according to God's Word and truth. And we will then have the proper attitude within that worship. If you're not a Christian this morning, then in reality you can't worship God except you can't come before His throne with grace. You can't express that reverence and that respect for Him unless you are a Christian. And so we would encourage you to accept that plan that God has set forth. Respect Him and His will enough to do what He says to become a Christian. And as we enumerated earlier in the lesson, if you have become a Christian but haven't lived in the way that a Christian should, you haven't represented Christ within your life. So when people see you, they are, are not seeing Christ. And you need to repent and return to Him. And once again, allow it to be Christ living in you. Why not come this morning and 
make things right with God and enjoy the salvation that we have that God has given to us. We need to come and do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.